It used to be that flying was the domain of the, the rich or those who were pilots, but now uh, most people, flying is open to them. There's not many people now that don't fly or haven't flown at some time. It's become much more accessible now to most of us. But of course, flying has become more complicated. And uh, nowadays, flying can be quite a, an experience, a difficult experience. I had a, an advert in recently for the new uh, Airbus, the A380 Airbus. And it's going to be a wonderful flying experience. And this particular airline, who are based in Holland, they were encouraging me to fly with the new A380 Airbus, which they are going to purchase. And it will be an absolutely wonderful experience for me. Now, going on a flight now is quite a, a long process. You begin by... You've got to get your ticket first of all, and that is so complicated. It used to be you went along to a travel agent, you bought a ticket, and that was the end of it. Now, you can go online, and there are so many different sites you can go on to, and buying a ticket can be very complicated. Getting the right ticket, the suits you. So once you've got your ticket, that's one hurdle over. But then after that, you've got to make sure your passport is up to date. Uh, I got my new passport through the post last week, and as most of us, the photograph is absolutely horrendous. It's not me at all, it's somebody else they've replaced there. But my wife said, I've got to look at that face every day. So that really is me on the passport. So the passport's got to be made sure that's up to date. The immunizations and of course your foreign currency. Now don't go to Zimbabwe because if you go there, you will have a wad of foreign currency that is very large. You will get 300,000 Zimbabwean dollars for one pound. So if you spend three and a half pounds, you become a millionaire. It's an amazing uh, amount of money you get for your pounds over there. Of course, it's worthless. It's not worth very much at all. So once you've got your money and your foreign currency, then you need to pack your cases. And you need to make sure that your cases are within the weight limits because the airlines are getting very strict about this now. And in your flight bag, you've got to make sure that any fluids you've got there are no more than 100 mils and they've got to be inside plastic containers. Then you've got to go along and you've got to check in. And that will take three hours. If you're going on an international flight, you've got to be there in good time to make sure that you've got plenty of time to get through all the security checks. And then, of course, you go through security, you go through immigration and passport control. You go through those things. And once you're through that, you finally get into the departure lounge. And you keep watching the screen, hoping that your flight will not be one of the many flights that are delayed. But finally, you get on board the plane and you're very grateful that you're not sitting next to a 25 stone man who eats garlic and uh, who's been drinking at the bar beforehand. So you're very thankful that the person next to you is a normal size and you've been able to get your luggage onto the top rack. And you sit down and you begin to feel that you're really beginning to get on your way now. And of course, they do all the safety checks. You know, it's this way, that way and the lights and you've got to put your oxygen mask and they show you where your uh, life belts are and so on. And then you note that as you're getting on board the plane, they're filling the tanks in the wings, they're getting filled up with the fuel that's necessary. You've noticed also that they've put on board the onboard catering food, and you're pleased about that as well. You've also noticed they're loading the luggage on, and you're hoping, really hoping that your case is one of the cases that has been loaded onto that. You're looking at all, hoping you can see your case among them all to remind you that your case is actually on board your flight and is not going to the other ends of the earth. So once all the security checks are over, you're strapped in, your table is stored away, your seat is in the upright position, then they begin to start up the engines and they begin to push you out of the, the, the stand and then you get onto the runway. And then they fire up the engine and they feel the, the tremendous power of those engines. You've got well-trained crew there. You've got well-trained pilots. You've got a well-designed and well-built aircraft. And you're thundering down the runway and you can begin to feel that you're on your way to your destination. You can feel the sand under your feet. You can feel the sun. You can taste the exotic food. That's not the in-fight food. This is just the food you're going to be having <laughs> when you get to the other end of the destination. And you feel as though as you thunder down the runway, you're on your way. But one more thing has to happen. And if this thing does not happen, you will not go anywhere. What do you think that thing is? You've got to take off. I know, but something's going to happen before you take off. The flaps on the plane. The angle of the flaps has got to change. And as soon as the angle of the flaps, you begin to see the flaps moving up on the wings as you're looking out, you know that those flaps will 
change the altitude of the plane. The attitude of the flaps will give you the altitude that you need to get to your destination. And a little thought that I have this morning is this, altitude, no, attitude determines altitude. Your attitude will determine the height you will go to in God. And we're talking about attitudes just now, are we not? I wonder if you'd open your Bibles at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We're talking about attitudes. We're talking about the beautiful attitudes. We're talking about the attitudes that are found there in Matthew chapter 5. And the thought this morning is this, you will never gain any height in your relationship with God unless these fundamental attitudes are developed within your life. God wants us to walk. God wants us to run. But God wants us to mount up on wings like eagles. And for us to mount up into height and gain altitude with God, the attitude of our hearts is absolutely vital to this. These attitudes are foundation for kingdom people living under foundation conditions. For kingdom conditions. Look at Philippians chapter 2. It says there in verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now Jesus deliberately developed attitudes within his life. And because these attitudes were developed within his life, God could do something for him. Look at the attitudes. It says, although he was in very nature God, although he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, because he was equal with God, yet it says he made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant. He became made in human likeness. He humbled himself he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now those were his attitudes. And because he developed those attitudes within his life, what did God do for him? God exalted him to the highest place. He got the attitudes right and God gave him the altitude. Look at the height that God exalted him to. The highest place. And gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. The attitude determines the altitude. And just as Jesus needed to make those attitudes his, and because of that, God could trust him and exalt him to the highest place, so also with us. Our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, this sermon we're looking at is not for the curious crowds. But this is for dedicated disciples. Jesus has left the crowds behind. They are down in the valley there. Those people who were so needy, they needed the message, they needed the word, they needed healing, they needed demons casting out, they needed all of those things. But Jesus knew that the best answer to the multitudes was better trained disciples. And so he goes up onto the mountaintop and he gathers his disciples around him and he sits down. This is not going to be quick. This is going to take time. He opens his mouth. He's beginning to tell them all the implications of kingdom living. And he begins to teach them. And he wants to teach these people some of the attitudes that are absolutely essential to kingdom living that please God. Now, they were on a journey of change. This journey that Jesus was taking these men on was a, a journey that was going to take time. I'm so glad that God is patient with us. God does not expect perfection. If you've reached perfection this morning, I'm very pleased for you, but you're kidding yourself on. Uh, I'll ask your husband, I'll ask your wife, and they'll still tell me the truth about you. But perfection, we haven't reached that yet, but God is working with imperfect people. God loves us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us the way we are. We're on a journey of change. And he was taking these men on a journey of change. So much was going to rest on these men. And what a motley mix they were. You look at that bunch of disciples. This was not the, the intelligentsia. This was not the academia. This was not the creme de la creme. This was not the people who were the very best of the very best. These people were a motley bunch. You talk about a, a mixed bag. You know, one of them was a freedom fighter. One of them was a, 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 a traitor. Two of them, were. he gave them a nickname. He called them sons of thunder. And do you know why he called them sons of thunder? They were always thundering. 
They were always stunning. Shall we call fire down from heaven and destroy these people? We found somebody who was preaching in your name. He wasn't one of us, so we shut him up. And these two disciples were always thundering, James and John. You look at this motley bunch of people that Jesus had, and so much was going to rest on them, so he was teaching them. He wasn't just giving them a new message. He was training the messengers as well as giving them a new message. So he had so much to do with these men. He was changing their way of thinking. Now, you know what Romans chapter 12 says, that you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When God begins to change our mind or change our thinking, it can change how we live. And he was changing the thinking of these men. These men were steeped in religion. These men had been brought up with a religion that was probably the finest system of religion in the whole world. These men were steeped in religion, but Jesus had to help them unlearn a lot of the stuff they had. Old attitudes out and new attitudes. And look at the Apostle Paul. When Saul of Tarsus was saved, he was a man who had attitudes. My goodness, he had serious attitude problems. And before he could do anything for God, God took him into the Arabian desert for years and end and said, Paul, I have a lot of stuff to get out of you because I want to put some new attitudes into you. So this journey of change, as God begins to change our thinking, it is a process. It's not a crisis, it is a process. He wanted to give them a new understanding of what happiness was going to be for these people. Now, in the Beatitudes, uh, maybe you're beginning to discover this, there is a progression in the Beatitudes. You can't start at number three. Oh, I like the look of number four. I think I'll start there. No, God says begin at the beginning. You've got to start at number one, and after number one, you go on to number two. And after you've understood number two, then you go on to number three. There is a progression in the Beatitudes and they become progressively harder as well. Now, the first one that we looked at before, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is an attitude towards ourselves. As God begins to show us the truth about ourselves, you know, we all think we're bad, but we're not that bad. We all think, well, we've committed a few sins, but we're not horrendous sinners. And God wants us to know the truth about ourselves. The truth is this, that we have nothing in our hands to bring to God. We have nothing to offer God that will in any way deal with the sin problem in our lives. Listen to this little poem by a lady called uh, Maya Angelou. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not shouting, I'm clean living, I'm whispering, I was lost, now I'm found and forgiven. When I say I am a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and I need Christ to be my guide. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak and I need his strength to carry on. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I have failed and need God to clean my mess. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I am worth it. When I say I am a Christian, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say I am a Christian, I am not holier than thou. I am just a simple sinner who received God's good grace somehow. So none of us have anything to boast about. And the first beatitude tells us we are poverty-stricken sinners. And in the eyes of God, we have nothing whatsoever to offer him. And God says, blessed are the poor, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is a gift. It is not something we earn. Then we looked at the second one, the attitude to sin. Blessed are those that mourn, because they will be comforted. Christians sin. It happens. That's why the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and he's just. He will forgive us our sin. Christian sin. But the difference is we don't take sin lightly. We don't say, well, it's just me, Lord. You know what I'm like. It's just me again. I've done it again. I'm sorry, Lord. We say, oh, thank you, Lord, that you're very patient with me. We take it seriously. We mourn over our sin because we know what sin does to God. And so that's the first one and the second one. But the shocks are not over for this group of disciples. 
Every exclamation, and that's what they were. They were exclamations. Oh, the bliss. Oh, the blessedness. Oh, the happiness of those. And now he comes to the third one. And as this one begins to sink in, it would be one thing for them to understand what God thinks of them, that we are sinners. It's difficult to embrace a new intolerant attitude to sin. But this third one, this takes us a stage further on that we'll need even more grace for us to understand what God is doing in our lives. Blessed are the meek. Now the word meek, most people tend to think meek equals weak. We think the meek people are the weak people, the flabby person, the spineless person, the peace at any price person, the man who's only got an opinion if his wife gives it to him. What are you, a man or a mouse? Squeak up. You know, the kind of person who is, it's just, there's no gumption. Do you use that word down here, gumption? That's a good Scottish word, that gumption. There's no push, no drive. There's no willingness to take on the challenge. It's just a flabby kind of person. And we tend to think the meek person is the Uriah Heap person who just creeps around and there's no spine or backbone or strength or steel or manliness or womanliness in that person at all. But to the Greek people, their language was a very precise language. To the Greek people, this word meekness was such a big word. It was so big and so comprehensive that it was almost defied translation into English. In fact, the Greeks thought this word was a virtue that was so high that really only the gods could possess meekness. It was such a high virtue that they could not see it as something that human beings could possess this. Now, some see meekness as humility or gentleness or a selfless, lowly attitude. Now, these are all facets of the word and very important facets of the word. But there is more to it than that. This morning, we need to try and unpack a little bit of what this word meekness really has to mean. What does the word mean? Now, the Greeks saw a virtue as the balance between two extremes. For example, you have on the one extreme, recklessness. People who do stupid, daft things, they're just reckless. Then on the other extreme, you have people who are cowards. They will do nothing. Now to them, the virtue between recklessness and cowardice is courage. That is the virtue in, in between the two of them. And they see meekness as the balance between two extremes, which we will see in a, in a moment. Now the word has a particular reference to two words that you would not immediately associate with the word meekness. And the two words are strength and anger. Now meekness has a particular reference to strength and a particular reference to anger. What does it mean? The meek person is really a strong person. They're not a weak person. They're not flabby. They're not spineless. Actually, the meek man, the man who possesses real meekness, is somebody who has got a strength, but it's not a human strength. It's not something they've developed themselves. It's not the strength that comes from physical power or physical strength. I mean, if you're a fifth Dan karate expert, you don't get pushed around. You know how to handle yourself. You know how to look. People don't kick sand in your face. You've got a strength there and you can handle yourself. It's not that kind of strength. It's not the strength of personality. It's not the strength of wealth. It's not the strength of position or even the strength of knowledge. This strength, it comes from God. And it comes, or rather, it comes from knowing God. The people who know their God will be strong and do exploit. This strength comes from an inner experience, knowledge, and walk with God. Your strength comes from an outside source. It comes from God himself. The meek person has come to understand that God is for him. So who can be against him? What a revelation. If God's on your side, God's big. And I tell you, I'd rather have God in my corner any day of the week, you know, because God is big and God is strong. So the meek person has come to understand that if God is for, for him, who can be against him? He's come to understand that if he is weak, 
then he is strong because his strength is made perfect in weakness. It is a strength that comes from an incredibly strong God. So the meek man that Jesus is talking about here is the man who has come to an understanding that his God that he worships, the God that he loves, the God who is his father, the God who is his savior, the God who is close to him and cares for him, that God is incredibly strong and that God is for him. It's an attitude of humility, a dependence on God, a God confidence that can face up to the trials of life. The meek person has no strength or ability of his own, but it all has come from God. So it has to do with strength. So the meek man is a man who has come to understand that of himself, he does not have what it takes, but his strength comes from the Lord. What a source for our strength. Now that's the first application of the word. It has to do with strength. But what does it have to do with anger? What does it have to do with anger? Now this will seem very strange. Now for most of us, anger is something that usually we get angry at the wrong time for the wrong reason. Anger is a very misused uh, emotion that we have. Most of us, after we're angry, we're sorry for being angry because most of the time it's destructive and it's not constructive. You know what it's like with children? Sometimes they can wind you up, but of course your children are perfect. They don't do that to you. But children can wind you up sometimes and sometimes you get angry with them and you react rather than respond to them. Anger can be a very dangerous thing. Anger is one of God's greatest gifts to us. But it's also one of the most neglected gifts. It's one of the most neglected gifts. We need to be moved with passion as well as with compassion. Most Christians do not know enough about this. Now, compassion, like strong medicine, it needs to be used properly. Question, it is, ever, is it ever right for a Christian to be angry? Is it ever right for a Christian to be angry? After all, the Bible says, you know, get rid of all anger. It's one of the verses in the Bible. We think angry people are dangerous people. So is it ever right for a Christian to be angry? Now, the answer, of course, is yes. It is right for a Christian to be angry at times. But there is a selfish anger and there is a selfless anger. And there is a big difference between the two of them, between a selfless anger and a selfish anger. Christians don't get angry enough over the issues they should get angry about. We lack the passion of strong convictions. Do you know, in 2001... So I was reading some statistics. In 2001, 15% of UK Muslims regarded themselves as radicals. In 2006, this number has grown to 40% of UK's 4 million Muslims. That's a lot of radical Muslims now. They feel very passionate about what they believe. Now, we will probably not agree with what they believe, but they do feel very passionate about their cause and what they believe. You know, a few years ago, I was doing a series in Scotland uh, on the whole issue of Islam and connecting with Islamic people. And I decided I was going to go along to a mosque just to see what it was like. I'd never been in a mosque. I've seen them from the outside, but I've never been inside a mosque. So I decided to go along to a mosque and there was quite a big one in Stirling, not too far from me. So I went along and it made me realize what it's like for people to walk into church for the first time. You and I walk in every Sunday, we know what it's like. We're not unfamiliar with it. We know what's going to happen. We know who's going to be at the door. We know what's going to happen. We know where to sit. We know how to stand. We know when to stand. We know when to sit. We know when to pray. We know all the... But I went into that and I hadn't a clue what I was supposed to do. First of all, I walked in, no chairs. Just carpets all over the floor. Where do I sit? But immediately a young man came over to me and said, are you visiting us? I said, yes, I am. I've come just to observe. Is it all right? He said, yes, of course it is. He said, come over here into the corner, sit down and just watch. And at the end of the 
the service. And I won't say too much about that, but at the end of the, the service, this young man came over to me and he was a businessman. He had to get back to his work, but he didn't go back to open his shop because he sat with me for 45 minutes and witnessed to me. And he gave me the gospel according to Islam for 45 minutes with passion. He communicated his faith to me. He told me about the Quran, about uh, Muhammad, about Allah, about all this important to him. And with passion, this young man tried to get me to convert. Now, I was there to learn, so I was listening to him all the time. And I was impressed, not with his message, but I was very impressed with the passion of the messenger. So what about Christians and anger? Is it ever right for Christians to feel passionately about, of course, a cause? Of course it is. And I think the problem is that most of us do not allow ourselves to get passionate about things that we should get passionate about. Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek. Did Jesus ever get angry? Yes, he did. Remember that time when the leaders, they brought a crippled woman and they were using her as a means to trick Jesus if he would heal on the Sabbath? And the Bible says Jesus looked at them with anger. Can you imagine that look on his face? It must have been an awesome look of anger as he looked at those despicable leaders. They weren't the least bit concerned about the plight of this poor woman. They were only concerned about would he break their rules on the Sabbath? And he was blazing angry with them. You know, when I was a boy growing up, my minister was Alec T. Any of you know Alec T? Alec T, he could sink me with a look from 300 yards and he could shrivel me. And if we young people were sitting up the back misbehaving, he could look at us with his eyes and he bored right through us and we knew that we better wise up or we were in big trouble afterwards. He could look angrily at us and he knew how to control us even from the front of the church. And Jesus looked at these people and he looked at them with anger. Let me give you another situation when Jesus got angry. He went into the temple one day and he came into the Gentile court now, the Gentile court was the place of evangelism. It was the place where Gentiles, who were not Jews or not converts or, or, or godly people, they could come in and they could watch the Jews at worship. It was a place where people who were curious could come and have a look without committing themselves. They could look and watch the worship of the Jews. It was the place of evangelism. And what had happened to that place? They turned it into a marketplace. In fact, it was called the Booths of Annas. And all around the courtyard of this place, there were booths that were either changing money or selling doves or selling sacrifices or lambs. It was a place of commerce where all that they needed for their religion could be bought at a price. And those booths actually belonged to Annas, the high priest. The priests had turned the place of evangelism into a place of commerce. And what was Jesus' response to this? I tell you, I would love, of all the incidents in the Bible, I would love to have seen that incident as Jesus takes off his belt. This is gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He takes off his belt and he begins to wield that belt and he begins to kick over the tables and the money goes running everywhere and the birds go flying everywhere and the sheep go running everywhere and the money changes, he drives them out. And he is blazing with anger as he drives him out of the place and he clears the whole place. That's meekness. That is meekness. Did you ever understand meekness to be like that? We always think meekness was weakness. No, friends. Meekness is strength. But it's strength under control. It's strength for a passionate, for a good and a godly reason. It has to do with strength under control. It is not the absence of strong passion but it is the channeling of strong passion. The meek person would never use their strength to further their own ends. At his temptation, Jesus, the Bible says, he was full of the power of the Spirit. He went into the desert and he was tempted by the devil, but he would not use his power to alleviate his own suffering. He would not turn the, the stones into bread. He would not use his power for himself. Question. When is it right for a Christian to be angry? The Bible, after all, says be angry and sin not. So there's a place for anger, 
where we can be angry and not sin. When the critics attacked Jesus himself, they called him a wine-bibber, a drunkard. They called him a, a glutton. They called him somebody who was controlled by Satan. They said all things. But when they attacked him, when he was reviled, he reviled not against them. There was no response when they attacked him. And the Christian, the meek person, has no need to defend themselves because they know they're on God's side. Because they know their life and their reputation is safe with God. Because they have the faith in God's power. Because they're no longer ruled by fear. So the meek person does not have to retaliate when people are attacking them. But when they attack the name of God, when they abuse the weak or the vulnerable people, or when they put obstacles in the way of people finding God, there was a very strong, passionate response from Jesus. So when they touched him, no response. But when they touched the things of God, there was a response. I believe as Christians we have neglected, we have neglected the power of righteous indignation. And I think we have sometimes been so taken up with our blessings, so taken up with getting for ourselves, so taken up with all the, the good things that come we have sometimes lost out on some of the passionate issues that Christians should be involved in. Now, I know that many Christians and many of you here today are heavily involved in passionate issues. You feel strongly about issues that are important. And your passion is very obvious in your lifestyle. But I think there's room for more of us to begin to say, Lord, what do you feel about these issues? What does God feel about the abortion issue? Millions of babies slaughtered. What does God feel about injustice? What does God feel about the poor? What does God feel about the, the scale of waste in the Western Hemisphere and the scale of need on the other side of the world? As you know, I've just come back from Zimbabwe and one of the things I learned over there that when people have less and less, they seem to have more and more of God. And when we have more and more here, we seem to have less and less of God. I saw a level of worship there, a level of passion, a level of responsiveness, a level of hunger for the word of God, of people who didn't know where their next meal was going to come from, who were struggling just to survive and get through it. And yet I saw there are people who were so in love with God. And I thought, Lord, is it going to take that? for us to really begin to fall in love with you again and become passionate about the things that you're passionate about, to catch the heart of God. Do you know that God's got feelings? God's got feelings. There are things that God feels very strongly about. And he wants to communicate some of those feelings to us so that we catch some of those things as well. Now, there are many examples in the Bible of people who had it in their power to act with anger and revenge, but they chose to show a different attitude. Let me give you three examples. First of all, Joseph with his brothers. Remember that amazing moment when Joseph, who had been exalted to the highest place, he was the prime minister, and his brothers eventually come in front of him looking for food. He recognized them but they didn't recognize him and they did not know that the man who held their lives in his hand actually was their brother, that they'd sold into slavery and treated in a despicable way and Joseph had them in his power. And what did he choose to do with them? He could have said, boys, it is payback time. You are going to catch it. I remember all the nasty things you said to me, all those times that you made my life an absolute misery. Boys, you are going to pay the full price now. What did he do? He blessed them, fed them, brought them up from the, the land of famine and put them into a place where they were protected and fed and cared for for the rest of their lives. Now he had strength, but he would not use that strength for revenge. He adopted a different attitude. What about Job? Praying for his comforters. I love the end of the story of Job. When God finally breaks through. When God finally comes through and speaks to Job. And do you know what amazes me? God doesn't give him one explanation. All God does is give him 
revelation. And God says, Job, you think you know so much. You know nothing, Job. Where were you? And he goes through 77 questions. And you know, Job couldn't answer one of them. He flunked the exam totally. I sat a Latin exam once and I got 2.5% out of 100 for it. That's about the lowest mark anybody's ever got for Latin. But Job, he flunked every question. He couldn't answer one of them. And God said, if you can't answer the questions of the natural world, how can you hope to understand the spiritual world? And so God did not give him explanations, but he gave him revelation. And at the end of it, he said, now, Job, pray for your comforters. Pray for your friends. Job could have thought, pray for them? Those miserable comforters? Those men who made my life far worse, pray for them. And he could have said, no way. But what did he do? He adopted a different attitude. He had strength, but he wouldn't use it for revenge. And so at the end, he says, he prayed for them. And he said, when he prayed for them, God restored all the blessings back to Job. Because in praying for them, God blessed his life. And so he adopted a different attitude. Of course, the third one is that great one, David and Mephibosheth. Say that when you're eating something I mean, <laughs> with a sweet in your mouth. Mephibosheth, or Mephibosheth as some call it. Mephibosheth. David had finally come to power. No longer the fugitive, no longer running. Saul had made his life a misery for, for, for 17 years. But finally, David is a strong man, surrounded by his strong men. And he's in his own castle. He's in his own palace. He's surrounded by a nation who want him. Everything was going well. And he says, is there somebody left from the household of Saul? People thought, aha, he wants revenge on them. They said, yes, there is one. Mephibosheth, who's lame on both his feet. His nurse had dropped him when he was a baby. And David said, bring him in. And David, Mephibosheth came in trembling and full of fear. David had him and he was the representative of a house that had made his life a misery. But did he use his strength for revenge? He adopted the attitude of meekness. He said, Mephibosheth, you're going to eat at my table from now on. You're going to be clothed with my clothes. You're going to live in a house I will provide for you. And I'm going to give you back all the lands that your father lost. I'm going to give you them all back. That is strength. But that is meekness. But not using strength for personal ends. The meek person will not use energy to fight battles to advance himself. Defend his rights. They will not stand indifferently by in the face of injustice or oppression or neglect. The meek person cannot walk by on the other side. The meek person has got a strength, has got passion within him, but that person will channel that passion towards the causes that God feels very strong. Now I've told you that in all of these um, beatitudes, I'll give you an alternative reading, rendering of it. Look at this one. Blessed is the person who knows how to be angry at the right times and restrained at other times. Blessed is the person who knows how to be angry at the right time and restrained at other times. Now, what is the reward? It says, they will inherit the earth. Now, here's an amazing thing. World domination by meekness, not by might. This is not the mighty taking over the world. This is the meek inheriting the earth. Now, this would cut right across all the preconceived ideas about what people had about the successful and those who would inherit the earth. This cut right across that idea. He said, the mighty are not going to inherit the earth. He said, the meek are going to inherit the earth. Now, at that time, they were under the heel of the Romans. And they knew that these people, but the Romans eventually were replaced. They eventually faded away. Every world conqueror has himself been conquered. Now the world would say that the meek get nowhere and achieve nothing but it's what happens in the end that really counts. We take sometimes the short term view but God takes the long term view and in the end after it's all wrapped up and that reading this morning that was read to us from Revelation reminds us of the day when God is going to fill, his glory is going to fill the earth and one day when it's all wrapped up, we're going to discover it's not the mighty and the strong and the tyrants and the dictators that are going to inherit the earth. It's the meek who are going to inherit the earth. The earth is the Lord's 
And you know the final outcome, it adds up to strength and confidence in a person's life. Now there's a future reward, but there's also a present reward. Can we just open our Bibles in conclusion this morning at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Yes, one day we're going to inherit the earth. We know that's true and we look forward to that. We will reign with him. We've suffered with him. We will also reign with him. And we look forward to that incredible day. I just hope if the, if the Lord is allocating different parts of the earth for us to reign over, I would like very much to be allocated the Bahamas or somewhere <laughs> nice like that. Not Scotland in the winter time, but maybe the Bahamas or somewhere very nice like that. But we will reign with him. That's the future inheritance it's not something we win, it's something we inherit from the Lord. But there's also a benefit here and now, in the now. Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus says to his disciples, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The subject here is rest. Rest for our souls. Isn't that a marvelous concept? Rest for our souls. To have that inner rest, that inner tranquility and peace and stability and confidence. That no matter what's going on around us, we just know that inside in the inner sanctuary of the heart, there's a restfulness there. That no matter what is going on around us, it doesn't matter if the... the, 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 the um, the stall is empty, as Habakkuk said, and everything, there's a total economic collapse. It doesn't matter as though all of life's circumstances seem to conspire against us, yet inside we know that ultimately God is in charge and God will win. That inner rest. Now Jesus said, if you want to find us, there are three things for you to do. Three verbs here. Come, take, and learn. Come to me, the Christ-centered life. Take my yoke, the Christ-controlled life. Learn of me, the Christ-like life. What do we have to learn? He said, learn meekness and learn lowliness and you will find rest for your souls. You know, we live in a world today that is obsessed with rights. But you know, the Bible emphasizes responsibilities. We all have a responsibility. Look at that on the screen there. Different way of spelling it, but it comes to a great understanding of it. We all have an ability to respond. A response ability. And it's how we respond to this. Meekness is not something God will drop on you in a great big dollop. It is something, it is a fruit. And you create the conditions. As you get rid of the bad attitudes and get rid of the weeds and the stones and clear the ground, then when you begin to clear the way, then God will allow, God will, will allow the, the meekness, this gift, this fruit of meekness to begin to develop and become strong within your life. The beatitude starts with us wanting to have it. We want a different attitude. You know, Stephen was an incredible young man. I think Stephen was destined to become one of the leaders, the great leaders of the early Christian church. But at an early age, he was cut off. And he could so easily, as he was being stoned to death, he could so easily have resented and been angry against those who were cutting off his life. But look at the attitude of this young man. Do not lay this sin to their charge. Remember what I said at the beginning, attitude determines altitude. But look at the altitude of this young man. As the attitude is right, don't lay this sin to their charge. There's no revenge, no anger, no calling down and curses from heaven on them. As he gets the right attitude, look at the altitude that God gives him. He said, I see heaven opened. I see Jesus standing. Lord, receive my spirit. What a height God gave that. What an attitude. What an altitude. Because this young man had developed meekness within his life. Well, next week, we're moving on to the fourth and next week we're going to be talking about hungering and thirsting. Two, the two strongest forces, motivation within us. When you are hungry, you will do desperate things. When you are thirsty, you will do desperate things. A lot of people are hungry for food, hungry for success, but how many are hungry for righteousness? 
This series we're involved in hopefully is helping us to prepare to move up to the next level. This is the success of the secret life. God wants us to be a people who are getting the attitudes right within us. Getting the, when we get the attitudes right, God will give us the altitude. Amen? Come on, let's pray before we conclude this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the teaching of your Savior, our Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the truth that you're opening up to us this morning about meekness. And we thank you, Lord, you didn't just tell us what to be, you showed us what to be. You gave us an example. And our Savior came and said, look at me, learn from me, copy me, walk as I walked, behave as I walked, as I behaved. We thank you, Lord, you gave us an example in Jesus. And we want our attitude to be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And we choose, Lord, to become servants like you did. And Lord, as we develop these attitudes within us, we know, Lord, that you'll be pleased and you will, you will allow us, Lord, to go on and become the people you want us to be. And so, Father, we ask you this morning that you will give us help, you will give us strength, you will give us the power of the Holy Spirit, you will give us fresh desires and passions within our hearts, and you will help us to become a people, Lord, who become more and more in tune with the heart and the passions of God, so that we'll be a people, Lord, who develop and exhibit within our lives a true meekness. In Jesus' name, Father, we ask this. Amen.